Chapter 3 The pens of many writers would not suffice to describe with anything like historical fullness and precision the wild scenes of excitement which, on the morning after Election Day, burst forth on the floors of the various exchanges throughout the Union. The larger and more important, the money center, the deeper, blacker, and heavier despair which sank upon them after the violent ebullitions of protest, defiance, and execration had subsided. With some, it seemed that visions of their swift but sure impoverishment only served to transform the dark and dismal drama of revolution and disintegration into a side-splitting farce, and they greeted the prospective loss of their millions with loud guffaws and indescribable antics of horseplay and unseemly mirth. As the day wore on, the news became worse and worse. It was only too apparent that the House of Representatives of the 55th Congress would be controlled by the combined vote of the populist and free silver men, while the wild joy with which the entire South welcomed the election of Bryan and Sewell left little doubt in the minds of the Northern people that the Southern senators would, to a man, range themselves on the administration side of the great conflict into which the Republic was soon to be precipitated. Add to these the twenty senators of the free silver states of the North, and the new president would have the Congress of the Republic at his back. There would be nothing to stand between him and the realization of those schemes which an exuberant fancy, untamed by the hand of experience and scornful of the leading strings of wisdom, can conjure up. Did we say nothing? Nay, not so, for the Supreme Court was still there, and yet Justice Field had come fully up to the 80th milestone in the journey of life, and Justice Gray was nearly 70, while one or two other members of this high court of judicature held to their lives with feeble grasp. Even in due and orderly course of events, why might there come vacancies? And then? In spite of the nameless dread that rested upon so many of our people and chilled the very blood of the country's industries, the new year, 97, came hopefully, serenely, almost defiantly in. There was an indescribable something in the air, a spirit of political devil-me-care, a feeling that the old order had passed away and that the Republic had entered into the womb of time and been born again. This sentiment began to give outward and visible signs of his existence and growth in the remote agricultural districts of the South and Far West. They threw aside their working implements, loitered about, gathered in groups, and the words of Washington, the White House Silver, Bryan, Offices, Two for One, the South's Day, Reign of the Common People, Taxes, Incomes, Year of Jubilee, Free Coinage, Wall Street, Altigeld, Tillman, Peffer, Coxey, were whispered in a mysterious way with head noddings and pursing up of mouths. As January wore away and February slipping by brought Bryan's inauguration nearer and nearer, the groups melted into groups, and it was only too apparent that from a dozen different points in the South and Northwest, Coxey armies were forming for an advance on Washington. In some instances, they were well-clad and well-provisioned. In others, they were little better than great bands of hungry and restless men, demoralized by idleness and wrought up to a strange degree of mental excitement by the extravagant terrains of their leaders, who were animated with but one thought, namely to make use of these vast crowds of silver pilgrims, as they called themselves, to back up their claims for public office. These crowds of deluded people were well-named silver pilgrims, for hundreds of them carried in hempen bags pieces of silverware, in ninety-nine cases of a hundred. Plated stuff of little value, which unscrupulous dealers and peddlers had palmed off on them as sterling, with the promise that once in Washington, the United States Mint would coin their metal into Bryan dollars, giving two for one in payment for it. While these motley armies marched upon the capital of the Republic, the railway trains night and day brought vast crowds of new men, politicians of low degree, 
men out of employment, drunken and disgruntled mechanics, farmers' sons, to seek their fortune under the reign of the people, healers and hangers-on of ward bosses, old men who had not tasted office for thirty years and more, all inspired by Mr. Bryan's declaration that the American people are not in favor of life tenure in the civil service, that a permanent office-holding class is not in harmony with our institutions, that a fixed term in a point of offices would open up the public service to a larger number of citizens without impairing its efficiency. All bearing new besoms in their hands or across their shoulders, each and every one of them supremely confident that in the distribution of the spoils something would surely fall into his share, since they were the common people, who were so dear to Mr. Bryan, and who had made him president in the very face of the prodigious opposition of the rich men, whose coffers had been thrown wide open, all to no purpose, and in spite, too, of the satanic and truly devilish power of the hell upon earth known as Wall Street, which had sweated gold in vain in its desperate efforts to fasten the chains of trusts and the claws of soulless monsters known as corporations upon these very common people soon to march in triumph before the silver chariot of the young conqueror from the West.